was once a man who had a very naughty parrot. This parrot would shout at him from morning till night, and usually with terrible obscenities. The man tried everything to calm down the parrot. He tried to teach him better words to use. He admonished him when he spoke badly. Nothing would change the parrot's behavior. Eventually, one day in frustration, the man grabbed the parrot by the throat, shoved him into the fridge, and shut the door. There was an unholy caterwauling coming from inside the fridge for the first two minutes. And then suddenly silence. And the man was a bit worried. Had something happened to the parrot inside the fridge? Very gingerly, he opened the door, and there stood the parrot, contrite, head bowed. He shook his head and said to the man, I want to apologize to you. I'm so terribly sorry. I've behaved incredibly badly for many, many years, and I've decided from this day I will change my ways. I will never speak to you in that tone again. In fact, from now on, I shall be the very model of politeness and decorum. The man was flabbergasted. He wasn't expecting that from the parrot, but he said, well, you know, that's fantastic, and let the parrot out of the fridge, and the parrot started hopping towards his cage. But as he was going, he turned back towards the man for a moment and said, if I may ask, purely out of curiosity, what crime did the turkey commit? Now, I have a philosophical question for you this morning. The question is, which is worse? To change your behavior, your bad behavior, but not for any good reasons, uh, not because you actually feel any remorse about what you've done wrong, just as our parrot, for example, changed his behavior, but not because of any remorse, but rather he feared that what happened to the turkey might happen to him. Is that worse or better than feeling genuine remorse for your behavior, recognizing your behavior as, as a fault, and feeling really and truly bad about it, but not actually changing your behavior. Which of those would you consider to be worse? Now, our reading this morning contains two huge theological words, the words repentance and forgiveness. The context is that it was just after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, Peter is preaching to the people on the day of Pentecost, and the, Peter says to them, that this Jesus whom you crucified is both the Lord and the Christ. We're told that the people were cut to the heart when they heard this. They said to Peter and the other disciples, what shall we do? And Peter said, well, you need to repent and be baptized into the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You need to repent, there's the one big word, for the forgiveness, there's the other big word, of your sins. Now, what this has come to mean for most modern people, both within the church and without the church, when they hear that story, uh, is something along the following lines. That we should pray a prayer to God to say how sorry we are, because that's what repentance is. And then God will say everything's all right and we can go to heaven one day, because that's what forgiveness is. Well, Walter Brueggemann, the Old Testament scholar and writer, says... It was as far back as the 6th century, so early on in Christian history, that the Christian faith became both private and otherworldly. He says, in effect, the church gave up its preoccupation with material matters and became busy with spiritual matters of soul-making for the next world. In other words, things like repentance and forgiveness started to be private it's all about how I feel inside and otherworldly. It's all about whether I get to heaven or not. And therefore, they became disconnected from the realities of human relationships here in this world. So what if we were to turn back the clock? How did Peter's audience hear that, that ad admonition on that day? What did they understand when Peter said to them, you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, I came across an article by Rabbi David Blumenthal, a professor of Judaic studies at the Emory University in Atlanta. He was involved in the Catholic Jewish discussions, a dialogue during the period when the Catholic Church was considering uh, offering a formal apology to Judaism for all of the atrocities that 
Catholics have committed uh, against Jews over 2,000 years. Blumenthal discusses the Jewish concepts of repentance and forgiveness. And I think it's worth considering because it sheds light on some of the concepts uh, and as how they, how they would have been understood by Christians in the early church. So, first of all, repentance, uh, the Hebrew word teshuvah. And within Judaism, repentance is not just one thing. It contains at least five elements. The first aspect of repentance in Judaism is the recognition of our sins as sins. In other words, this is an act of the mind. It's a, an intellectual act uh, of moral consciousness. It's, it's recognizing intellectually that the thing I'm doing or the behavior I'm displaying is actually wrong. The second element is one of remorse. And here we move from the mind to the heart. This is how I feel about things. This is where I feel remorse where I feel sorry for the things that I've done, anguish about my failure. The third element is uh, desisting from the sin. In other words, this is an action. This is where you actually do something, where you stop, you cease to do the, the harmful behavior um, and the harmful actions. The fourth element is restitution, which is where you make good as far as you're able uh, towards uh, for, for the damage done and towards the one who has been damaged by your actions. And then the fifth element is one of confession, and this is either a ritual or personal uh, element where you actually confess your sins to God. And for Jews, this is something which happens privately, not, not to, uh, you know, it's towards God inwardly and not towards a, a confessor. But what's interesting is rabbinic tradition is very clear. The aspect that makes or breaks Teshiva. Um, is the question about whether you've actually changed or stopped your be bad behavior. That's, that's what makes or breaks it. You can recognize your actions are wrong, you can have remorse for them, you can even make restitution towards the people you've damaged and confess towards God, but none of these constitute teshuvah in its entirety if you don't actually stop doing the sin. From a very different context, I remember a, a, an African friend of mine a, a, um, saying to me once, we were at a conference together, a guy by the name of Pataza from Orlando, one of the townships outside Johannesburg. Uh, we were at a Christian conference and uh, we were talking about the situation in South Africa of uh, the truth and reconciliation process that was underway at the time. And I remember him saying to me, if your cow is in my garden eating my daisies, he says, if you come to my door and you say, Pataza, I'm so sorry about my cow eating your daisies. I, I'm, I'm heartbroken and I want to apologize to you. Will you forgive me for my cow being in your garden eating your daisies? He said, your apology means nothing to me if you don't actually come to my house, take your cow and remove your cow from my garden. In other words, you have to actually stop what is going wrong for it to mean anything. And when it comes to forgiveness, again, Judaism has a, a, a different understanding. Within Judaism, there is a very concrete and material understanding of what sin is. In other words, it's, sin is not understood as a, simply a spiritual reality. Uh, Blumenthal, when he writes about this, says, Sin disrupts our lives on the human level. It distorts our relationships with other persons, social institutions, and ourselves. Sin also disrupts our spiritual lives. It distorts our relationship with God and our deep inner spiritual being. So because actual persons are hurt, actual persons are involved, sin occurs and because when, when, when sin occurs, and because actual relationships are damaged by sin, Judaism teaches that only the offending party can make thing, put things aright, and only the offended party it can forego the debt that sin incurs. And so within Judaism, there are different levels, again, of uh, uh, forgiveness. The most basic level of forgiveness is where, uh, where you forego the other person's, person's indebtedness. In other words, we relinquish our claim against the offender. That is the first level. It's perhaps a judicial or, or uh, level of, of the thing. We relinquish our claim 
against the offender. The second level is more than judicial, it is an act of the heart. And this is where we reach a deeper understanding of the sinner, where we begin to achieve empathy for the troubledness of the other person. And obviously this doesn't happen in every case, and, and nor, nor should it necessarily happen in every case, uh, but that would be a, a deeper level of forgiveness. And then the third kind of, uh, third level or deepest level of uh, um, forgiveness is called atonement. And the Hebrew word kapara or kipper, from which we get the, the name of the festival, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Uh, this has to do with purification. This means a total wiping away of all sinfulness. If you like, you could call it an existential cleansing. And this is something that only God can grant. Only God can offer this kind of forgiveness. So, my point in going through these Jewish historical uh, uh, understandings of repentance and forgiveness the point is not that I wish us to return to a fully Jewish understanding of these terms, but I do think that some reflection on the complexity of these terms um, will help us broaden our own understanding of what we mean when we talk about repentance and forgiveness. For starters, take the idea that repentance involves a mental recognition that what we have done wrong is wrong. Um, this is an intellect intellectual act of admitting that what I'm doing is a sin, that what I'm doing is wrong. Now, this seems counter-cultural in the world in which we live today. It seems that we live in a culture where even our most high-profile leaders, and I'm sorry to say sometimes especially our most high-profile leaders, own up to absolutely nothing. They're like slippery eels. You cannot pin a thing on them. And this trickles down to the rest of us because we say, oh, well, that must be how you, one, one should behave. Admitting fault is seen as the worst possible thing you can do. Just whatever you do, don't admit it was your fault. And so we live in this constant cycle of self-justification and lies to cover up more lies, of shifting the blame and then rewriting the history or the narrative, as, as we call it, uh, so that we can't possibly be blamed for what has gone wrong. We do this, and the question is whether this is helpful. Now, you can argue that this isn't helpful for the rest of society, but is it even helpful for us, shifting the blame in this way, when even alcoholics recognize that the very first step towards healing is the, an acknowledgement of our wrongs as being wrong? Or take, for example, the idea of restitution as part of, re of repentance. Now, a totally private faith means that we simply have to feel sorry to repent. In other words, it's only about how I feel inside. A totally otherworldly faith means we simply have to confess to God in order to be forgiven. But restitution is concrete and material, and it affects the community, not just the sinner, because it opens up the possibility that the offended one may also receive justice. And what about the understanding of forgiveness? The Christian understanding of forgiveness is most closely related to the third of the three uh, Jewish uh, understandings of, of forgiveness that I spoke about, the highest one or the, the deepest one, the idea of atonement. And rightly so. This is the forgiveness that only God can offer. And this is also the kind of forgiveness that Jesus claimed he could offer to sinners. Uh, that's incidentally why he was blamed, uh, he was called a blasphemer because he claimed to offer the kind of atonement that only God could offer, and that's why they crucified him. So this kind of forgiveness is a big deal. Peter's audience knew it was a big deal, and that's why on that day 3,000 of them, when they heard that this was on offer, immediately came forward for baptism and entered the faith. But I wonder, have we maybe lost something of a full appreciation of what forgiveness means because this is the only form of forgiveness that we talk about. You see, atonement was a big deal for Peter's audience, and indeed for Jesus' audience before him, because they saw it as being over and above the other forms of, of forgiveness, which were more, uh, more earthly and material. They saw it as being over and above the cancelling of debts, and they saw it as being over and above a, gaining a deeper understanding of the sinner. 
concrete acts of forgiveness that take place here and now between victim and wrongdoer. And my fear is that if we skip straight ahead to atonement, to being put right with God, um, without actually being forgiven by those whom we have wronged, is that not cheap grace? Is that not just gaining a feeling of being okay, I'm all right with God, without doing the costly work of reconciling with my neighbor? If repentance and forgiveness are only private, in other words, they happen in my own mind or my own heart, and if they're only otherworldly, in other words, they only affect the next life and not this one, then surely when we talk about these things, we're just playing religious games because it doesn't make a difference in the world. I would argue that true repentance and true forgiveness change our human relationships. They have consequences in our society. They change the social contract within communities and between communities. They change the power dynamics between oppressor and oppressed, between rich and poor. And far from being purely and only exclusively religious concepts, repentance and forgiveness rightly understood are a firm and godly basis for true and lasting justice in the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.